Thanks a lot um, for that, Lalita. I'd like to uh, start with a narrative. I have some friends out there, I think, who have heard my description of this narrative before. I hope this won't diminish it for you because it, it doesn't dim it with my, my retelling. Um, it's called The Seashell and the, and the Sea. Um, there were once two architects who were, designed, who were asked, commissioned to design aquariums. And the first architect started with the inspiration of the multi-chambered Nautilus. It's a seashell that has survived the ravages of time. And um, upon inspection and looking at a dissected Nautilus, found that it had multi-chambers and uh, based on the Fibonacci series. And so he developed a plan based on exactly that. The, the um, tanks for the aquarium ranged in sizes. He discovered the amazing spiral made of the Fibonacci series became a wonderful route for circulation. And he ended up with an aquarium with an amazing form, with amazing sets of spaces, but came out looking pretty much like a shell. The other architect started with the inspiration of the sea. And he found that the sea was about high tides and low tides. He found that it was about the most luminous shallows of the Maldives and the deepest shadows of the Mariana Trench. Oops. The, about the most delicate ecosystems known to man, as well as the most powerful currents and waves. He found it was about sunrises and sunsets and about food chain. And his aquarium became an amazing, wonderful building that was about shadow and light and about the power of the imagination. Everything we know about creativity about creative, creativity in design can be seen in these two examples. Above, we have creativity, uh, we have uh, in, uh, associative creativity, and at the bottom, we have inventive creativity. They both take tremendous amounts of effort to do very well, but a vital difference separates them, and that is that associative, associative creativity begins with a substance of form, and to the result of uh, things which are generally, formally, associative. Inventive creativity, on the other hand, begins with the substance of content, to effect that its results are usually original in nature. I'd like to talk about creativity, uh, creative design, and its inter relationship to interdependence today, but not in a way that's commonly heard. Um, firstly, because creativity as a, is usually seen as this wonderful big playground where everyone's invited into, and you know, you share and partake in this grand scheme of things. I'd like to talk about, if I may be forgiven uh, today for being a bit more critical, I'd like to talk about creativity as in its different shades. And uh, because, at the level of originality, because there are different uh, shades of, of, of uh, creativity. Uh, with respect to interdependence, because it's commonly seen as what happens between people, I'd like to, and, and you know, that sort of interdependence usually ends up with in, in failed uh, uh, friendships and, and slit throats and blood spilled, or it results in uh, something that of considerably more value. But it doesn't matter which way interdependence usually ends. I found that, that in most cases, interdependence, that warm, fuzzy collaboration, usually is made up of teams. And within each team, there is a leader. And if it's a bad leader, well, that collaboration or interdependence goes flat. If it's a good leader, what happens usually is that leader is responsible then for collecting and guiding and really editing all the ideas that come together which result in a series of formal dependencies. So I'm going to be talking about the dark side of, this, of what independence is, interdependence is. Um, about a year ago, I was asked to um, uh, present a paper at a seminar in Boston having to do with the global architect in the free trade era. It was a, a seminar organized by uh, Massachusetts Institute of, of, uh, Institute of Technology, sorry. <laughs> Anyway, um, the whole issue, that in the course of my research, I began to understand that the organizer's ag agenda for this uh, seminar had to do with the rising level of ubiquity that was happening in the world. What is ubiquity? Well, ubiquity is about 
the well, sameness. It's about commercial, commercialization in a way. It's about the same banks and the same hotels that you stay in to visit the same global events, the credit cards that buy you the same design magazines and browsing devices, handphones and watches, and the same cars that come from the same shipping containers. It's about uh, um, economy of scales. The question or the underlying agenda was, is architecture affected? Is design and architecture affected by sameness around the world, this homogenization of society and culture? And you can ask many different architects and designers, and a lot of them will say, yes, you know, environments are becoming ubiquitous, and buildings are looking the same. But so I thought I had to do some research into this. And so what I did was I started looking at Asian cities, which was the focus of my research, and I found out that, you know, they are quite different. You can recognize Hong Kong from everyone now, Singapore, <laughs> from you must know this, Shanghai and Beijing. And even at the level of streets, signages, there is difference. And so I began to realize, well, what is this ubiquity that everyone seems to feel underlies environments? So I looked on and I went into Hong Kong and even buildings designed by specific architects changed from city to city. That's the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank by Norman Foster and the uh, court, Justice Courts in Singapore designed by the same architect. Very different one from the next. And in Putrajaya, you know our pride and joy, <laughs> we've got such a variety of, of, of form, it's amazing, from our uh, Prime Minister's Palace, which is kind of like Central Asian, Gothic, to you know, uh, um, modernist, uh, expressionist buildings, and um, you know, modern tech, high tech, it's, it's, there's a lot of variety going on. And then I looked at airports. Even airports demonstrate a lot of difference. That's the Suvarnabhumi Airport in Bangkok and uh, our own KLIA. Uh, vastly different. And the new, um, the new Performing Arts Center by Zaha Hadid in, in, in Guangzhou, a, a marvelous building of, it's just unbelievable. And uh, of course, the uh, Taipei 101 in, in, in Taiwan, um, designed after the form of a, of a bamboo shoot, I think you guys, do you know where I'm going with this? And this image of Dubai stunned me because I'd never seen Dubai. I never thought of Dubai as an amazing city, but this was, is beautiful in, in a very, I really mean that in a heartfelt manner. It, it's, it's like um, Frank Lloyd Wright's Mount High Tower come to life, this spire. There's something very Gothic about it. But in the course of looking through images of, of, the, uh, of Dubai, I began to find a series of images that tied three buildings together, that finally I found a certain sense of similarity between them. And it's these three buildings. That's the um, Twin Towers, well, the former Twin Towers in New York. Our Petronas Twin Towers and the Burj Al Khalifa in Dubai. Would anyone like to hazard a guess what they have in common? Sorry? Well, the first thing I thought would be that they were at one point in time the highest buildings in the world. But no, I found out that they're clean in exactly the same way. Oh, over a period of, of 40 years, we haven't changed the way we clean our buildings. <laughs> and, and in case anyone's curious, you know, oh, that's kind of like modern somewhat, but if you look deeper, it's still the gantry, and then they still hang like monkeys, you know, from the <laughs> shade of the building. And so I began to look a bit closer at content, and I found that all buildings are still clean in the same way. And that's the, well, over, yeah. And, I found that after all the pizzazz and fireworks are over, even sports stadiums feel kind of like what they were inspired after, which is a bird's nest, but heavy and all that. And the more I delved into it, I realized that, you know, the whole idea of circulation in a sports stadium hasn't changed in the last 50 years. Airports, you know, don't you hate it? The first thing you see in any new city is actually the underbelly of an airport and the ex exhaust of taxi smoke and stuff. We haven't changed the way um, our vertical, our, I mean, high-rise buildings are horizontally striated, cutting off floors so that people don't communicate with each other. And the only times you meet someone is on the way to the car in the elevator or, you know, third floor, please. And, and it kind of bothered me that materials are used in exactly the same way, plaster glass ceilings, um, glass handrails, um, um, huge, HVA systems pumping out cool air into huge spaces, marble and granite used in exactly the same way we have since time began, as well as, you know, well, glass elevations being double glazed and heat resistant and all that. We've not really used technology in a new way. And 
In a world where you could reach someone over the course of a split second on a handphone, where we can stick men under the water for a year at a time, where we've got fiber optics and we can look, that can look into the uh, this vessels of human beings, and we've almost discovered the difference between a standard Higgs boson and another kind of Higgs boson, <laughs> that we still use migrant labor to clean our buildings. That's the Empire State Building in 1932 and the bird's nest uh, a few years ago. But it isn't really about migrant labor or cleaning buildings, is it? The whole issue is that there's no global sh shortage of creativity in form. The ubiquity and sameness we experience globally is due to uncreative content. So we're back to form and content. And it's this interchangeability of the concepts, the duality, the dual concepts of form and content that has led us to this path. That's what the problem really is. We have made a categorical mistake. A lot of times we talk about, con we think we talk about content, we're actually referring to form. I'd like to talk about an instance where that mistake, that interchangeability doesn't happen. In the world of music, we've got composers, that's Beethoven's sixth pastoral, and we've got disc jockeys. Now, there's a very, very marked difference between composers and disc jockeys in music. But there isn't such a distinction in, in design. In music, the composer starts with the basic building blocks of the musical note and makes amazing compositions from that. Disc jockeys take parts in whole or in bit to put them together with a catchy beat through it and it is very commercially viable. I enjoy disc jockeys too, but there's a critical difference between the two. But in design, such a difference doesn't exist. There's something that's very pervasive in the world right now called I call design disc jockeying. That in schools, we do a lot of that. You know, the open book, we're looking and we go, oh God, this is a great idea, and that's a great idea. Let's try to put it together with a catchy beat, and wow, we've got new design. And, but there is a difference. And, um, there was a T-shirt that became globally famous about five years ago that came out of Thailand. You know, in Thailand, it was a great T-shirt because, firstly, it put together this wonderful clothing of, of uh, global backpacking recognition together with a very, very famous Thai phrase. Um, when you went to the black market and asked for a Rolex watch, and they came up with one, and you know, it was offered to you, and you'd go, well, but is it real? Is it a genuine watch? And they would go, oh, it's the same, same. <laughs> and then, uh, but different. <laughs> so, so the front of the T-shirt says that, and the back of the T-shirt said that. It was a brilliant moment of, uh, of association, of associating a fantastic, very local phrase with a global uh, um, 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 a form of, a, of, a, of a backpacking identity. We're living in very strange times, are we? I think we're living, we're living in the era of the T-shirt. <laughs> you know, think governments, think banks. Quantitative, quantitative easing, form. No change in content, and we keep on changing the way form appears without working on what content really means. Over the course of um, the last three months, I've had the opportunity, privilege of speaking with a, few, a lot of young, passionate people who came to me with the same sort of a, a concern, that they were really wanted to do something to make change in the world, to become recognized for something that they have done, you know, that was very important to them. This next slide is dedicated to all of them. Do any of you recognize these faces up here? Yeah? I'll just run through them for the benefit of the majority. Well, you know, before I started researching this, I didn't really know a lot of who my heroes look like. That's Susan Sontag. She's a, a, a very famous writer and critic. That's um, Neom Chomsky, a professor of linguistics at MIT, and one of the most vocal uh, critics of American foreign policy since the late 60s. This is John Berger, who's a famous art critic and a writer as well, who's now an activist in, in, uh, in the Middle East. That's Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who invented the World Wide Web. Um, Ron Paul, who is actually the American senator who would have made change in the United States had he been actually uh, supported by, uh, to, to run for president. Um, everyone knows Anurad Roy. 
She's only written one book, but what an amazing book. And now she's fighting about dams in India. That's uh, Jimmy Wales, Wikipedia. Um, Naomi Klein, who's kind of like Noam Chomsky's heir apparent, very, very clear about what the problem in the world is currently regarding uh, capitalism, free markets, advertising, the global banking industry. And that's John, Jonathan Ive, who invented everything that sells with the Apple on it since the iPod, which is arguably the best design Apple ever came up with. And you know, not recognizing these people doesn't make any difference because they are incredibly important to me. And this is the last bit of interdependence I like to talk about. Within every one of us, there's this amazing bit of interdependence that goes on between your passion and the way it's expressed. It's your content and your form. Con your, our individual contents, which is the genius of who we are, is, is, can be characterized by what we're passionate about. The problem is finding the right medium to express that passion. And that's the last form of, uh, of interdependence, which I feel that we've kind of forgotten. I'd like to end on this slide here, the first slide I started out with, the whole issue of um, form and up there and content. For all of you young people out there, you know, in, in, uh, in architecture school or in design school, you know, you always had a lecturer over the backs of your shoulders going, you know, that's not right. And then someone else comes along and goes, after you've made changes, no, that's not right. Don't you just hate that? Now, if you're ever faced with that conundrum, ask yourselves, is that professor talking about form or content? And it resolves a lot of issues for you. For you young people who have just graduated, try to understand that interdependence that your content, your passion has with the mode of your expression and finding that balance, which those people I showed before, that's how they've channeled what they believe in into something which is completely independent, interdependent one on the other. And for all you professionals, those, those people who are as old as I am or older, who, who have relied on form your whole lives, take care of that whole issue of content that you, know, you could be leading a whole lot of other young people astray, for example. And for everyone else, the young who, are, who, have, who have hearts of passion and the old who are young at heart, um, don't, don't lose hope in that whole issue of what content can mean in your lives and change whatever has been. Thanks very, very much.